This week we've come back to Eastnock Castle near Ledbury in Herefordshire. With its massive walls and picturesque turrets, Eastnock is a perfect example of a medieval castle. Except, of course, that it isn't. It was actually built in the early part of the 19th century. It's equally dramatic inside with some authentically huge pieces of furniture, a comprehensive array of armour and a very fine collection of Italian artefacts. We shall be picking our way through these treasures with Paul Atterbury. Also today, some uh, choice moments from the roadshow that you won't yet have seen. Meanwhile, back at Eastnock Castle, we're in the Long Library, and very atmospheric it is too. But, Paul, we've established that the house itself isn't classically old. Lots of the contents are valuable. Yes, exactly. If you build yourself a, a medieval 19th century castle, you've actually got to fill it with old things to give it authenticity, to give it style and class, if you like. And you have to collect those together from sales, from local families, from the Grand Tour, what have you. In this room, which is a fabulous sort of statement about 19th century Italian taste, we've got these wonderful, actually Flemish tapestries, but bought in Italy. We've got the fireplaces, which were carved by Italian craftsmen from Italian marble for this room in the 1860s. And we've got this great collection of pieces brought together um, to give the atmosphere of Victorian Italy. And here's the archetypal Italian piece, Romulus and Remus. Yes, absolutely, a 17th century casket, and here we are at the very foundation of Rome. Another wonderful piece, of course, is this Casapanca, which is a, a, a large bench, as you can see, um, Medici um, coat of arms on it. Here we're in the late 16th century, a typical piece that was assembled in the 19th century to give this atmosphere of the past. You had to walk in and feel that everything had always been here. But, of course, a room like this, this great library, designed in 1860 by George Fox, was also modern Italian work. Um, all the library shelves were designed by Italian craftsmen, and, of course, they bring together past and present in the way that was so common in the 19th century. Well, we've plucked one book from the thousands here about a collection, and it's a collection of armour this time, so this is a sort of catalogue, isn't it? Yes, the catalogues were always very important because this gave the things authenticity, um, documentation. Um, every family had its tame scholars, if you like, and they were great am amateur antiquarians. Now, this is the catalogue of the armour at Goodrich Court, which was a very famous early collection of armour dispersed in the early 19th century, and that's how these collections were formed. And the catalogues are what tell you how things worked and how it all fits together. Um, there's wonderful collections of armour here. Um, these sort of pieces tell us so much about the history of taste. Everybody wanted to have the sense of the Middle Ages. Whether they actually walked around the rooms clanking in all that armour, I've no idea, but they certainly had it on display. And this very piece here is in the entrance to Eastnor Castle today. The owner of Eastnor Castle for the past ten years is James Harvey Bathurst. For him, it's meant coming home, because this is where he was brought up. Wow, suitably impressive dining room, and James, this is one huge table. Well, it certainly is. Of course, it takes a, a large table to fill a large room, and this is a terrific table of mahogany um, sections of wood uh, made from Cuban mahogany, and um, with extra leaves that we've added, because we needed just to fill it up, uh, the room up a bit more, and it's a, it's a really great experience dining here at night with the candlelight reflected in the wood. Mm. And overlooking it all, of course, previous masters of the house. Certainly. Um, this actually is not just the master of the house, it's the builder of the house. John Firstell Summers, painted by George Rumney. Um, he set the whole thing going, finished it off, and would have handed over to his elder son over here, but his elder son, sadly, um, had gone to join Wellington's army to fight Napoleon in the Peninsula War, and he was killed at the siege of Burgos. So his younger brother, John, the second earl, um, inherited, and he again continued the decoration and collecting in the house um, and added this, a lot to it uh, during his time. Now, this uh, great solid server here, it was actually made on the premises, wasn't it? Well, it's certainly in the estate yard. A lot of, a lot of timber for the house was, was produced on the estate, so a lot of oak was cut down. And this is a nice piece because it's got this little feature here, which is a, a sort of Gothic arch, which was incorporated in a number of other places in the house and um, is a sort of feature that, that you'd expect to find in a castle like this. And a couple of tons of ceramics above. Well, luckily it's strong enough to take them. These two charges were made in 1931 uh, by Wedgwood, and so is this, this huge vase. Um, dedicated to my grandfather who commissioned it, painted by um, a family called the Powells, 
and they're very, very nice pieces. And all part of the ongoing collection. And now we've come to the drawing room at Eastnor Castle. Paul, another room, another style. Yes, and this time it's the High Victorian Gothic Dream. Um, this room was created by Augustus Welby Northmore Puget in the late 1840s. He will be known to people perhaps as the designer of much of the Palace of Westminster, the Houses of Parliament. And he was brought here to, in a sense, bring up to date what was already a Gothic building. And he started, if you like, with the fireplace where we can start. You've got this family tree which descends through the ages, giving the historical background that the family felt they needed, um, and the great coat of arms, which, of course, forms the fireplace, wonderful colour and, and carving. And down below, you've got the tiles, beautiful colours, new printing process developed by Minton, and then the totality framed by these um, brass fire dogs, which, of course, were made just for that setting. And the centre of the room, obviously, is this magnificent chandelier. In a way, they were Pugin's trademark. If he had clients rich enough, he would persuade them to have one of his great chandeliers, made by Hardman of Birmingham, a fabulous statement about modern Gothic. And they were designed to be seen hanging against this sort of highly coloured ceiling. When he came into this room as an interior decorator, effectively, um, the structure of the ceiling was already there. But he thought, no, that's a bit boring. Let's bring it to life with colour and pattern and richness. And this is very much what that period was all about. We think of it as being rather heavy and dull and ponderous. It wasn't. It was very lively. It was the full pageant of the Middle Ages brought into the modern Victorian world. And is everything here by Pugin? Yes, Pugin was one of those sort of very demanding all-round designers. If you commissioned him, he wanted to do everything, all the components of the living space everything that made the room work and defined his style. In this room, for example, there are candlesticks by him, now used as lamps. There's very lovely pierced door plates and door furniture. But, of course, the main thing here is the suite of furniture he designed for these rooms. We've got the lovely um, bookcase with its fantastic marquetry panels. But some people, and I think me in many cases, would like the desk best. Um, it's got that lovely carved um, stretcher rail beneath it, which defines it and makes it a very strong piece. And, of course, this superb table. Yes, the octagonal table was one of his favourite motifs. Um, and you can see here it's elegant, it's modern, it's decorative. It has all the force of decoration in this room. But at the same time, as with all his furniture, this and the chairs conform to certain basic principles. Let me show you on the chair. Traditionally, this is a very old-fashioned X-frame chair, but actually it's a very modern piece as he saw it. You, he's revealed the structure. You can actually look at it and see how it all goes together. It's a, a modern, defined piece of design. Honesty, integrity, these, is, these were words that he used. Truth to materials. And in a sense, a piece like this defines modernity in the Victorian period. So is it unique to be found nowhere else but in this room? These designs were used for other clients, but every piece was created and crafted for that particular client. If we look at the table, here in the centre is the S for Summers. That's a motif that is picked up in this room again and again and again to make sure you know these were made just for that family. So Pugin was a, a high-class interior decorator? Absolutely. You or I might have our bathroom done, our bedroom done, our living room in the latest fashion. He was doing that for a different sort of client on a grander scale. What he brought to Eastner was the great modern Gothic style of the 1840s, 1850s. And his legacy to us today is that here at Eastner we have the greatest surviving example of a domestic space in the Gothic style of that period. It was the third Earl Summers who, in the middle of the 19th century, filled his home with fine furniture and works of art. We've only had time to look at a little of it today. Interestingly, one of the most exotic objects that he acquired was mislaid and only discovered just a few years ago when one of the cellars was being renovated. There, leaning against a disused oil stove, was this Assyrian tablet, nearly 3,000 years old. It's now been restored to a place of honour, and the Earl would have been delighted. From Eastnor Castle, goodbye.